Hello, this is David Gordon Koch reporting for the NB Media Co-op. I'm speaking today to Matthew Hayes, a professor of sociology at St. Thomas University and a spokesperson for the NB Coalition for Tenants' Rights. Matthew, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, David. Uh, first of all, the Liberal government has introduced legislation for a 3% rent cap starting in February. What's your take on this legislation and what's uh, missing from it in your view? Yeah, so I think that the legislation and the Liberals' campaign promises were intended to address um, the rapidly declining affordability of housing in New Brunswick. And if the goal is to um, really uh, address that problem, this legislation lacks ambition. So it's uh, certain that for folks who are in their apartments now, this measure is going to help. But um, what we've seen in New Brunswick since um, probably uh, the, especially 2018, 2019, is the rapid reduction in the number of affordable uh, housing units. So, you know, between 2016 and 2021, we were losing in New Brunswick about 33 units per week that were affordable um, to uh, folks earning less than, than $30,000 a year, about the minimum wage at full-time uh, hours. So those are that's an important stock of housing. And it has really, it has gone down by 40% in St. John, 40% almost in Fredericton, uh, almost 50% in Moncton. And that was in, you know, our cutoff date for those numbers is 2021. So since then, uh, things have we know that things have gotten really worse because New Brunswick has led the country essentially in uh, rental price inflation. So that's an indication that more of the that the uh, affordable end of the housing universe is disappearing. So, so we're talking about well, sorry to interrupt there, but we're talking about, for example, rooming houses or or apartment No, we're talking with... about market rentals in uh, in apartment buildings, uh, in, you know, triplexes or duplexes, in uh, basement apartments, in wherever. The universe of housing, the, the, the affordable end of that universe is getting um, compressed significantly because the conservative government that is thankfully now in the past uh, didn't act when it was absolutely necessary that they do so. And if they had acted uh, in 2021, as they should have, with something like a 3% cap like the one being proposed now, uh, we would be in a better place right now. Um, however, we didn't do that. And so the number of affordable units that remain for, for folks on uh, modest incomes has, uh, has, has really significantly uh, declined. And the current proposal for a 3% cap is not going to prevent further um, uh, compression of that market. So on tenant uh, turnover, uh, landlords can set the rent at whatever they want. And that means that uh, you know if you're leaving your apartment and you're looking for another apartment, or if you're looking to move into a rental apartment and you need something that's relatively affordable, those apartments are the rarest finds, uh, and they will continue to be the rarest finds because uh, folks, investors, landlords, people who own uh, excess housing are basically going to set the rate at whatever they can. You know, unless there's, there are people out there who are um, able to afford to provide uh, less affordable uh, uh, or more affordable, sorry, rentals, but uh, a provincial housing system shouldn't be uh, relying on the goodness of, uh, of folks, you know, uh, to, to provide uh, lower uh, rents. There should be rules in place to make sure that the, the overall universe, the, the, the stock of housing remains affordable for a broad range of New Brunswickers. And so you mentioned a moment ago that when turnover occurs, that's when rent will go up. And so this leads us to what I think is sometimes called a vacancy control, where the rent has to remain the same, uh, or that there's a limit on how much rent can increase even between tenants, correct? Yeah, so what we're calling for is rent control that's tied to the unit and not to the tenancy. Uh, so that means that when the, the, the tenant leaves the apartment, 
um, that the amount that the landlord can increase it by is limited by the legislation. And that's what's missing in this proposal. So if that were added as an amendment to the current legislation, um, what it would mean is that um, you know uh, uh, the the overall universe of affordable housing in New Brunswick would be more or less contained. That we wouldn't lose affordable housing units that we need. Um, and bear in mind, uh, David, no one's building uh, uh, housing that is as affordable as the existing housing stock. New construction is all in the range of 2,000, uh, 2,600 or, or whatnot, somewhere in that range. Um, you know, we're not seeing anyone build housing that is more affordable than what we currently have, uh, which would be apartment units under $1,000 or under $750, which are needed by a broad number of New Brunswick renters. Mm -hmm. So the public has an interest in maintaining this housing stock. We can't just allow investors to make as much money as they can. Uh, it is within the public purview. It's within the, the responsibilities of government to ensure that the housing market is working for, for New Brunswickers. And in order to do that, we need to be thinking about the affordability of the overall housing stock. The current legislation indexes the liberal campaign promise of a 3% cap, but it doesn't actually do what it was what the promise was intended to do, which was to ensure affordability of housing for New Brunswickers. So that's our main concern. We think that it's the main concern of most supporters of the Liberal Party, and we hope that um, that this legislation, uh, you know, that there's time to amend it be because that's what's needed. What's happening that like the, the neoclassical theory of uh, that seems to dominate housing policy in Canada and in, in the uh, in most media circles right now is that if you build more supply, um, the cost of housing will go down. But if you're a housing scholar, you know, even if you're a housing economist using these neoclassical concepts, housing is a sticky, you know, the price is sticky on the way down. Uh, people who have invested in housing are not going to drop the price of it um, because it, it uh, they stand to lose a lot of money as a result of it. So some of these neoclassical principles are not going to work out. You have a, a housing universe, basically. Uh, and, and let's talk about the, the rental universe. Um, the it, the new construction that's being added to that universe is entirely on the top end. So if you take a look at the statistics that are available through Statistics Canada for housing, um, the, that housing universe between 2016 and 2021, you see that for uh, you know people who can afford housing above two thousand dollars a month, the supply of housing has dramatically increased. There's no shortage of housing. In fact. There are new projects in Fredericton that are that still have empty units in them. Uh, they can't be filled. Uh, you know, it's the real um, uh, irony, basically, of this housing crisis. Uh, meanwhile, on the lower end of the market, uh, people are clamoring to find whatever they can that is in decent enough, decent enough shape and that's affordable. So it's really an affordable housing crisis. And the idea that some of the older housing stock will become, you know, uh, more affordable uh, through adding new supply at the upper end is uh, just empirically challenged, to say the least, David. Um, what's happening instead, what's happened in New Brunswick, especially since 2019, is that investors, some from within inside the provinces, uh, from the province, other Others from outside the province are buying up the, those older uh, properties as uh, la smaller landlords look to get out of the business, uh, you know, or, or retire or, uh, you know, take profits from uh, the, pro uh, the, the real estate boom. They're selling those units and those investors uh, are, are basically uh, recognizing that in a free market, those those goods are underpriced, and that they can uh, achieve super super profits basically just by increasing the rent. And the the goal of those uh, those investors is is not just to make money um, uh, by increasing the rent; it's to increase the value of what it is that they just bought. Uh, you know, that increase the value of the the real estate itself, um, and they do that by increasing the rent because for rental. Uh, investors, for investors in rental properties, 
uh, there's a relationship between um, the rental income uh, that you're getting from the property and the the overall market value of the building. Uh, so property owners in New Brunswick uh, have been undervaluing their buildings on a national uh, scale. And, and basically what's happened in the last five years is that market actors have started pouring into New Brunswick because they recognize that there's quick money to be made. And this is the result of a lack of regulation. You know, if, right if there were rent control here, this wouldn't have this wouldn't have happened in the same way. Even if the rent control were bad, it wouldn't have happened in the same way. And am I right in understanding that as the uh, you know value on paper of these buildings increases, then uh, <clears throat> then uh, developers or uh, investors can uh, use that value to leverage it to get more uh, uh, financing, borrow more money to engage in other ventures, perhaps, you know, real estate or otherwise. Uh, yeah. Is this, is this part of the, the process? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at Killam Reit, for instance, which is New Brunswick's largest landlord, um, they, you would want to look at the relationship between uh, their revenues and uh, the amount of money, the, the returns, the dividends that they pay to what they call unit holders, or basically people who hold shares of Killam Reit. Um, there's a gap between the two and the gap is made up by basically borrowing money from the, um, the increase in the, the value of their housing stock. So every year, Killam, who own throughout Canada about between 70 and 75 buildings, I'm not sure exactly what it is now, um, but about 10% uh, of that, that, that stock will be uh, re, um, re-evaluated, reassessed. They'll go through uh, an assessment and, um, you know, the evaluator will find that, oh, you know, this uh, building that hasn't been assessed in a number of years has increased in value because of the real estate boom in Canada. And um, th they can then take that uh, new valuation and refinance their um, their uh, their purchase or their, their, their uh, mortgage on that property. So they can convert some of the equity that is accrued through just the, the acceleration of housing prices into excess liquidity that they can spend either on dividends to their investors or indeed they can they can pay their CEOs more if they want. Um, and they can also, of course, go shopping for more doors, as they put it. And, uh, you know, this isn't just large investors who are doing this. This is also small investors, dentists in Saskatoon who decide that, you know, they want to own property and uh, uh, can make use of um, property management companies that exist in large New Brunswick cities like St. John and Moncton, uh, you know, buy up houses, single family homes. Um, and they're valuing them in terms of what the rental income is worth, not in terms of how New Brunswickers have generally evaluated, you know, whether or not a home is worth what someone is asking for. Mm. So, uh, I mean, this is the kind of new reality of the housing market. It's, um, it's driven by a short term logic of increasing profits, uh, which are oftentimes passed on to investors out, uh, outside of, uh, of the immediate transaction, basically, of the you know, buy and sell of housing or uh, you know, the, the, the landlord-tenant um, relationship. So um, the, the result of that is that housing increases in costs, not just for tenants, but for homeowners too. Everyone is paying more for housing, whether it's through an increase in taxes or if you're trying to buy a house the cost of housing has gone up, and that's because of a lack of regulation in the housing uh, in the housing market. On that note, uh, I, I want to mention that I, I reported on some of the you know really dramatic increases in rent that we saw, uh, especially since uh, the height of the COVID nineteen pandemic. And uh, in one case, I interviewed a landlord who said that part of the reason that this had to happen was that 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 he was he and his part business partner were increasing the rent was because of the renovations that were required to bring the place up to code that it was in a very bad condition and so on and similarly i mentioned uh uh rooming houses earlier we, you know we've seen a number of cases here in uh, moncton where 
um, buildings were uh, torn down after the fire marshal found that they were uh, substandard. Um, these places that uh, that where people were, um, you know, were able to live for you know perhaps five hundred or less per, per month. Um, and so, you know, to me, I find I found this fascinating because it seems to also point to uh, a problem of of regulation of of just housing being maintained in good condition if if it's affordable for people. Uh, just any comment on that? Yeah, I mean, there's several things that that um, that can be said about that. Um, you know, one of the things that we're worried about with the current legislation, which again is tied to tenancies and not to units. Uh, is that um, that it will uh, stimulate rent evictions. Um, so that becomes basically the way that landlords can get around the legislation because the new tenant will pay whatever the market will bear. So if the uh, landlord finds that the rents are below what they should be getting, they can actually be incentivized to find ways to get rid of existing tenants. And they can do that by making major renos. They can do that also by harassing tenants, um, by not doing repairs that are needed, for instance, uh, to encourage people to move on. Um, so the Liberals seem to have uh, tried to address this through the, the pass-through mechanism in the existing legislation, which allows big increases in taxes or uh, capital costs to be passed on to tenants uh, at the clip of 9%. So, Really, they're talking about a 3% cap, but the cap is 9%. Uh, you know, landlords can get that 9% if they can convince um, the uh, whichever agency is going to be, I imagine, NB Housing or the um, Tenant Landlord Relation Office, uh, that the renovations that they're making are necessary. Uh, so you can get 9%. 9% is not 3%. It's going to tax uh, people who are on fixed incomes and trying to remain in their homes. Um, it's going to be really difficult also to maintain the affordability, the overall affordability of the housing stock. Um, so those are some of the concerns that we have about that. Now, it's important that landlords be able to maintain their properties, and that means that capital costs, in some cases, will need to be passed on to tenants. Um, but uh, the current proposal makes the pass-through permanent. So I can get 9% permanently um, by basically uh, doing some renovations. Um, the proposal that we put forth was to cap this at 6% uh, and to allow the pass-through to be amortized over a 15-year period, after which the increment basically... Uh, so not all of that 6% would be the capital costs that would be going over to, um, uh, to uh, tenants, uh, would be a fraction of that. And that capital costs would be returned so that you maintain the broad affordability of the housing market. So after that 15-year period, it's possible that the tenant that was there initially is now gone, but the unit uh, will perhaps drop in, in rent by, you know, two or three percent, whatever the capital pass through was. Um, and, and that helps to maintain the affordability of the housing stock. Similarly, uh, the liberals have been talking about, you know, tax cuts and uh, tax cuts for landlords as a way of increasing affordability. But there's no mechanism to pass that on to tenants. So our proposal actually was to have a pass-through mechanism that would enable tax increases to go uh, to be passed on, uh, like big tax increases to be passed on to tenants, but also big tax cuts to be passed on to tenants. And we don't have that. Uh, so that's something that we're concerned about. We'd like to see done. You know, in, in terms of thinking about the future of um, a grassroots activism on this, this is the start. This is not the end. Our housing strike struggles are not going to end with this. The legislation uh, is, is not actually oriented towards fixing the problem that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. It is, um, I, you know, it, 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 cynically, one could see it as window dressing. It indexes the liberal government, the liberal opposition at the time, the, the opposition's promise basically that they would bring in a 3% rent cap, but that the proposal that they have doesn't address 
the situation that they were that their promise was oriented towards. So we need to remind the government that the reason why they made that promise was because we were in an affordable housing crisis. You study and write about migration, and as you know, there has been a massive anti-immigrant backlash in Canada with many people blaming, this is a you know, very widespread uh, view that immigrants or migrants are to blame for housing costs. Uh, well, you know, simultaneously in, in the United States, we've seen Donald Trump uh, re-elected after uh, campaigning for mass deportation, the largest mass deportation in American history. Uh, y y your comment on, on these, uh, these developments. Yeah, this is really the result of a confused debate, national debate in Canada and perhaps also in the United States uh, about what this housing crisis is. And again, it's an affordable housing crisis. It's not a lot, just a lack of supply. It's not to say that we don't have to build more housing. We do. But we also are building more housing. So if you look at the stats, uh, you know, between 2016 and 2021, the housing universe actually expanded faster than the population. Um, I, I think if you take a, then take a look at the year, yearly statistics um, from, from Statistics Canada and from the CMHC on um, housing completions and uh, people moving to New Brunswick, you'll see that uh, there is a, there's a gap that emerges late in 2021 or 2022. I think it's even in tw late in 2022 where if we were to look from 2016, we could say, well, actually, our population now is increasing faster than our housing supply. But the number of units that are in construction right now are at record highs. So one could be optimistic that despite many challenges, including labor market shortages, for which we may need actually to have more migration to the province, um, we're keeping up with demand, just the way that the, the market is supposed to work. The market is reacting to the increase in demand, but it's only increasing to demand for units that it can afford to build and, and sell uh, profitably. So that means at the upper end of the market. And new Canadians, we know, are, um, you know, there's some who can afford uh, um, uh, uh, expensive rents, but Disproportionately, new Canadians uh, benefit from and require uh, lower, uh, lower cost housing, which we have been giving away to investors, essentially, through uh, lack of regulation. We have allowed investors to take our affordable housing stock and m double its price for n with no return to us. We don't get anything out of that. Um, they get all the benefit from it. And it has, uh, you know, it's produced an, uh, a backlash against the, 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 this idea that, well, you know, if we could reduce demand, and the demand is now coming from, um, from people outside of Canada, then everything would be good. I mean, the, the hypocrisy of this is uh, really evident in New Brunswick because of the, way, the different way that migrants from Ontario here have been treated relative to migrants from outside of Canada. We talk about the fact that migrants from Ontario have increased um, the housing costs, but we think that they're coming to, to New Brunswick is a good thing. And I, I agree. I think them coming to New Brunswick is a good thing. I'm glad that they want to build their lives here. Similarly, for people coming from outside the country, I'm glad that they want to build their lives here. Let's build our lives together here. Um, and, uh, you know, the housing supply issue there are things that we can do probably to increase the supply of new housing stock, but we're still going to need the affordable end of that universe. And, you know, to do that, we're going to have to use other mechanisms. Uh, so uh, the, the short of it, David, is the market is responding to the increase in demand and is building, I think it's building enough housing. It's going to, uh, we're in a short term uh, crunch perhaps, but it's going to uh, even out. There's still a vacancy rate for most units. So things are gonna be okay. The issue is at the lower end of the market, there, there is not, uh, things are not gonna be okay. And so the result is that too many people who need more affordable housing are getting poor in their current housing situation. And that is the result of a lack of, of government intervention in the market. And this lack of intervention 
is not being sufficiently addressed by the current legislative proposal coming from the whole government. Just uh, before we wrap up, just wanted to get your comment on uh, what the government's role should be, the appropriate role for government in actually uh, building affordable housing, uh, non-market housing and so on. Yeah, so uh, historically in Canada, government hasn't played a huge role in, um, uh, in, in affordable housing, but it has played a big role in developing market housing. So much of the current boom in market housing development is a result of federal government uh, policies that are subsidizing um, developers, giving them access to preferential interest rates. There was a period in the 60s and 70s that lasted through most of the 1980s, where um, the government played a much bigger role than it currently does in building and financing uh, nonprofit housing, whether it was um, owned by the public, so the stock that we have in, in New Brunswick now of ND housing units, uh, or owned by a nonprofit or co op entity, so in, in New Brunswick, the Rising Tides Initiative, as an example, uh, or Kaleidoscope in, um, uh, in St. John. Um, so funding for that was basically uh, cut throughout the 1980s under the Mulroney government, and it was almost completely ended by Paul Martin uh, and Jean Chrétien in 1993. Um, so the, you know, when, when we, again, when we think of a lack of supply, especially supply of affordable housing, the reason why there's a lack of supply is because the government hasn't been building any. Um, and they haven't been facilitating the construction of new affordable units. So even the, the, the national housing strategy that the Trudeau Liberals brought in in, in 2018, the um, subsidized units that they're, that they're building are less affordable than the market housing that we have been losing over the course of the last several years due to a lack of rent control. Um, the alternative to, to this would actually be to have the government participate in um, in building nonprofit housing again either nonprofit housing that's going to be owned by a provincial agency like ND housing or um, by a co-op or nonprofit organization uh, and we need to ramp that up significantly back in the 1970s and 80s uh, you know Canada was producing like 20,000 uh, more than 20,000 units of non nonprofit housing every single year um, our current uh, um, uh, subsidies from we're spending, you know, billions of dollars at the federal level every year. We're not producing as much um, of the housing. Uh, we're and our population is almost twice as big as it was in the late 1970s. So um, we're getting less bang for our buck. <laughs> we're getting less affordable housing. Um, housing that that will not be owned by the public sector after the, um, the contract with developers has ended. So most of the current NHS uh, funding has a 15 or 20 year timeline, after which that, that unit, which was subsidized up to a certain point, um, again, not as affordable as the market affordable housing that we're losing, but more affordable than the current market rates, um, they're gonna become market housing again. Uh, so the public is spending a lot of money and getting very little in return in terms of uh, housing affordability. Um, there are other alternatives, you know, uh, uh, a building program is one. The other that I think is really important and is just beginning to be explored by other Canadian cities is uh, housing acquisition funds. So rather than this older stock of housing being sold on to investors uh, who are going to increase the rent, uh, it is bought by housing agencies and nonprofits, which um, NB Housing, for instance, could facilitate if it had a budget to buy the, this housing. Um, uh, that, that would help us basically build the stock of social housing in the province. And uh, you know, affiliated with that, we would be able to control the pricing. Um, and we can make, make, make sure that, uh, um, you know, this wouldn't ne necessarily be a money losing uh, proposition either because uh, uh, we, could, we could buy um, and finance that over a much longer period of time than most investors can, be, uh, you know, as a government. 
Mm-hmm. And um, uh, we could provide those rents at their current their current rates um, uh, rather than basically allowing investors to double them and uh, run away with lots of profits. Mm-hmm. So um, those are the, the things that need to be done. Like we need to build more affordable housing and we need to ensure that the current market housing remains affordable. And if that means making it public, then I say let's make it public. Okay, well, I've been speaking to Matthew Hayes, professor of sociology at St. Thomas University and a spokesperson for the NB Coalition for Tenants' Rights. Thanks uh, so much for speaking to the NB Media Co-op today, Matthew. Thank you, David.